Moving on to the cerebellum, which is found posterior to our brainstem structures here and segregated from them by the fourth ventricle. So here is our cerebellum. And the cerebellum, as we know, is important for fine-tuning ongoing motor movements. And it's also going to adjust our postural muscle tone so that when we are sitting or standing, we maintain the tension necessary in those muscles to keep us upright and balanced. So let's look at some of the anatomical features of the cerebellum. And probably the easiest way to do that is to go ahead and look at it. So here we have an inferior view, and we can see some major anatomical features that are evident on the surface of it. We have two major lobes that we can see on the surface, and another one that we can really only see in sagittal view. We have the anterior lobe, shown here in blue, and that is separated from the posterior lobe by this primary fissure. So here's our primary fissure, which is a landmark separating our anterior lobe from our posterior lobe. We also have this midline structure called the vermis, which segregates the left and right hemispheres. And this thing is so-called vermis because vermis is Latin for worm. And you can see how anatomists would think that this looks like a worm. We also remember that the cerebellum is covered with a gray matter cortex, just as the cerebrum is. However, in the case of the cerebellum, we have a different type of infolding. We have these long, thin infoldings called folia, which means leaves. So think of sheets of paper or leaves of paper in a book, and it kind of looks like pages in a book. So these are our ways to increase surface area. So this is our cortical infoldings on the cerebellar surface, the folia. And if we look in sagittal view, we can see that flocular nodular lobe right here, and that's this green one. Now, if we look inside the cerebellum, we have white matter. And we have these white matter tracts that are highly branched, and for that reason are called a tree. The tree of life is what the anatomists decide to name it, using the Latin term arbivitae. So these white matter tracts are going to be connecting this, this gray matter cerebellar cortex to the deep gray matter cerebellar nuclei. And we will also see that we are going to have the cerebellar nuclei are going to have outputs, and those outputs are going to go via some of our communication pathways to the brainstem. So what we will see is we've got three major communication pathways, white matter tracts, that are connecting the cerebellum to other brain structures. And these white matter tracts are called peduncles. And peduncles, of course, is like a stalk connecting one part of the body to the other. It comes from the Latin foot or ped. And we have three of them. We have a superior, a middle, and an inferior. So our inferior is down in this region. Our superior is up here. And our middle cerebellar peduncle is here. I'd also like to point out the fact that since we've cut this in sagittal view, you can also see inside the fourth ventricle here, and you can see some of that choroid plexus inside that makes our cerebrospinal fluid. Now, as for the peduncles, these white matter tracts that are bringing information to and from the cerebellum, we have one that we've already seen before. One of those white matter tracts, as you recall, is the middle cerebellar peduncle. And that's going to be bringing information from pontine nuclei to the cerebellar cortex. So let's see if I can put my model back together again. Once again, we have our pontine nuclei on one side, and that information from the pontine nuclei will be sent across these pontine transverse fibers and then via the middle cerebellar peduncle to the, to the cerebellum. Then we have our superior cerebellar peduncle, which is simply going to be conveying information to and from the higher brainstem regions, such as the, the midbrain. So this is basically going to link the midbrain with the diencephalon and the cerebrum, the structures above it. And then we have our inferior cerebellar peduncle, which is going to be linking the cerebellum with the medulla oblongata and the spinal cord, so structures below it. So the way to think of it is inferior is linking the cerebellum with structures below. The middle is linking the cerebellum with pons. And then the superior is going to be linking the cerebellum with the midbrain, diencephalon, and cerebral structures above it. All right, so let's look at the major output of the cerebellum. The major output cell is called the Purkinje cell. And this is one of the 
largest types of neurons that we will see. In fact, it's probably the second largest neuron type outside of another neuron, this pyramidal cells that we mentioned earlier. They're going to have very large pyramid-shaped cell bodies. We'll study them later when we get into cerebral cortex. But the Purkinje cells are these extremely large neurons with extremely highly branched dendritic fields. And we will see that these are found in the cerebellar cortex. And they will be receiving information from several types of cells. One of the main types that we recall is the climbing fibers that are originating from that inferior olivary nucleus in the medulla oblongata. And this is going to be bringing information to the Purkinje cells and synapsing on about 500, making about 500 synapses with the Purkinje cells. Whereas we're going to have some other cell types, we're going to have some parallel fibers that will bring up to 200,000 synapses or make up to 200,000 synapses with Purkinje cells. Without getting into the details of the circuit, which is really quite beyond the scope of this course, we can say that the Purkinje cells are very highly connected cells, and they're going to have a single output that is GABAergic that is going to be two cells of those deep cerebellar nuclei. And remember, the cerebellar nuclei are located embedded within that white matter tract that is going to be, um, looks like a tree that we call the tree of life. All right, here's a picture of some of these Purkinje cells here. They're highly branched dendrites. Here are the cell bodies, and here are our output axons. All right, what happens if there's damage to the cerebellum? Well, people will have movement disorders. And movement disorders are often called ataxia, ataxia having to do with movement, ataxia, a lack or a disruption in movement. And this can happen for a variety of reasons. It could be permanent due to damage, or it could be from drug abuse or alcohol intoxication. So sometimes you will see people who are not very coordinated or they're staggering or stumbling all over the place. And this can result from the disruption of the cerebellar function. All right, let's move on now to the midbrain. And the midbrain is going to be the top of the brainstem, located between the brain or the, the top part of the brainstem that is going to be just below the diencephalon. So we have talked a little bit before about some of the structures in the midbrain. We talked about the fact that the midbrain is going to be mediating reflexes to auditory and visual stimuli. And these reflexes will be mediated by the top part of the midbrain. And we can really divide the midbrain into two parts. The roof, which is Latin. Tectum is the Latin for roof. And that's going to contain the parts of the midbrain that are going to mediate these visual and auditory responses, respectively. And you can see these four blobs up here. And these little blobs are like hills. So we have a superior set of hills and an inferior set of hills. And so colliculus is the Latin term for hill. So we call the superior set of hills the superior colliculi. Colliculus is singular. Colliculi are plural. So we have a superior set of colliculi that are going to be mediating responses to visual stimuli. So maybe some bright light or something flashing out in the periphery that draws your attention to it. We also have the inferior set of hills here that are called the inferior colliculi, and they are going to be mediating responses to auditory stimuli. So maybe a car horn that someone's beeping in your ear or some loud noise that goes off somewhere. And of course, that's going to draw your attention to it so that you can look and see what caused that stimulus. Is it something that is important that you need to attend to, or is it something that you can ignore? So taken as a whole, these four blobs, these four little bodies, can be called the body of four. And we just used the Latin term for this, the quadrigemini, the corpora quadrigemini. So if you think of Gemini, the constellation, you know, Gemini means twins. So quadra Gemini, instead of being two, there are four. And the body of four, literally, is what this means, corpora, body, quadra Gemini, of four. So we've got the body of four things here. And those four things include the two superior colliculi and the two inferior colliculi. 
And all together, they're going to make up the roof or the tectum of the midbrain. Now, if we look a little bit anterior to that, we will eventually find the walls and the floor of the midbrain. And the floor of the midbrain is called the tegmentum, which is the Latin word for floor. And in the tegmentum, this is where we will see our substantia nigra. The substantia nigra is shown here in this dark green thing. And as we recall earlier, the substantia nigra is going to produce dopamine. And it's a very important center for producing dopamine. And if there is damage to this area, then the person will end up with Parkinsonian-like symptoms. We can also see between the corpora quadrigemini and the substantia nigra, we have this thing here, which is called the red nucleus. And the reason it's called the red nucleus is that it has a fairly high iron content. So there is a little bit of a red tinge to it. And this is going to help us maintain our postural tone and subconscious background movements of our upper limb position, upper limb and torso position. In other animals, it has a lot more importance. For humans, not as much. It can serve as a backup if, for some reason, there is a problem with other motor input systems that would be controlling these structures. And we'll talk about that in a little bit later segment. But for right now, just know that the red nucleus located between the substantia nigra and the corpora quadrigemini is going to adjust background postural tone and um, so forth with the upper limbs. All right, we can also see here the end of the reticular formation. Remember the reticular formation is that mass of diffuse gray matter with nuclei embedded in it that extends all the way from the medulla oblongata up through the pons and ends in the midbrain. And it's very important for maintaining consciousness and awareness. All right, we also have some nuclei associated with cranial nerves. So in this case, cranial nerves three through four will, three and four, will be attached here in the midbrain. And then we have, um, as well as those, we have some very important white matter tracts here that are anterior. You can sort of see them on the model as well. If I pull the model apart and pull the cerebral cortex off of the model, you can see that we have very large white matter tracts that are descending, and these are called cerebral peduncles. And this is going to be connecting that primary motor cortex that we talked about last time in motor neurons that are going to be sending motor commands down to the spinal cord and to other brainstem nuclei, and also going to be carrying ascending information coming up from the spinal cord and some of these brainstem nuclei up to the thalamus. So this is a major super information highway, as if you could think of it that way. So it's kind of like got north and south lanes, massive, massive, capabilities of carrying information up and down. So from the cerebrum to the spinal cord and from the spinal cord, and I should say structures lower to the midbrain up to the diencephalon and the cerebrum. So the cerebral peduncles are basically super large white matter tracts that are sitting sort of anterior laterally on this structure here and relaying information up and down. All right. So we've already talked about the tectum, that's the roof, just to remind you, Latin for roof. And that's where we have our corpora quadrigemini, which is our body of four. And the superior colliculi are the top two blobs up there, the superior hills, if you will. And they're going to be processing visual reflex information. And your inferior colliculi, the two blobs on the bottom, are going to be processing auditory reflexes or mediating auditory reflexes. So processing auditory sensations and mediating reflexes to them. Then we have our tegmentum, which is our floor. We have within the tegmentum, we have our substantia nigra. That's toward the bottom. That's just a little bit deep to these cerebral peduncles. And then we're going to see our red nucleus. Again, both of these things have colors in their names, substantia nigra, which is literally black stuff because it's highly pigmented with uh, melanin, which is a byproduct of dopamine production. And this is going to be very important in a circuit that we'll look at later when we look at the cerebrum, looking at some deep nuclei in the cerebrum called basal nuclei. And so there are going to be 
some important circuits involving the substantia nigra with the basal nuclei that will also be important for controlling motor movements. And we will see that people who have damage to this area will present with Parkinson's-like symptoms. The red nucleus, as we've said, which helps us control our upper limb position and motor tone, is going to have a bit of iron in it, so it has this sort of reddish color. We've already talked about the cerebral peduncles. There's a left and right one, and basically these are massive super information highways of light matter that are running the length of the brain. All right, so here is the actual thing, and we're looking at it from the back. I should have pointed that out in the previous diagram of it as well. We're looking at a posterior view, and we have actually in this posterior view, if you look at this, now this is a sagittal view, we've cut through, basically we've cut sort of obliquely, and you can see part of the fourth ventricle as well. So you can see the opening of the fourth ventricle right here toward the inferior part of the midbrain. So here you can see the midbrain here and here. Here would be our corpora quadrigemini. We have our superior and inferior colliculus. And here we have our cerebral aqueduct that is going from the third ventricle, located between the two thalamic halves, through the midbrain, and down into the fourth ventricle, located between the pons medulla oblongata on this side and the cerebellum on this side. So that's just to orient you. So we're looking at a posterior view, and we've cut some of the tissue away so that you can see into it. So it's as though we've cut away the cerebrum up here, we've cut away the cerebellum as well, and we're showing this area right here so that we can see this back portion, this posterior portion. And then we're kind of looking through the structure. And this is an actual dissection. So here we can see our corpora quadrigemini right here. So superior colliculi, inferior colliculi. And here we have part of the diencephalon called the pineal gland. That's the one that's going to secrete melatonin, which is important for regulating circadian rhythms. We'll get to that when we get to the diencephalon. But I thought I would point it out here because of its proximity between the two superior colliculi. Here we see the thalamus, which is above the midbrain and part of the diencephalon. So here we have our superior and inferior colliculi together making the corpora quadrigemina, which is the body of four, and that is going to call, create the roof or tectum of our midbrain. Here we can see laterally a little bit of our cerebral peduncle, and here's part of it too. They put it here. A lot of it is right here. If you were to look through, I don't think you can see it too terribly well here, but if here is our superior and inferior colliculus. You can see the cerebral peduncle already. You can see it laterally here. All right, now let's look at the structures that are a little bit deep to this. And to do that, we have to take a different view through the midbrain. So here we have sort of a transverse view. You can see they've taken it through the superior colliculi here. So you can see part of the superior colliculi, they've been sliced through. And then you can see the inferior colliculi below them. You can see your cerebral aqueduct, which will lead into the fourth ventricle. You can see the cerebellum, and this one is left intact. So here you can see the cerebral, cerebellar cortex, these folia, these infoldings of gray matter on the cerebellar cortex. Now, if we look anterior, this is our tectum right here. And if we look anterior to the tectum, we've got the tegmentum, tegmentum meaning floor. And really the thing that separates the tectum from the tegmentum is the cerebral aqueduct. So here we have our red nucleus here. You can see it on both sides. And then we have our substantia nigra, which is producing dopamine. And this is a very important region that, as I say, when it's damaged, it can cause all kinds of movement problems and Parkinsonian-like symptoms. Then we have our cerebral peduncles here, and these are those massive white matter connections that are running longitudinally. 